Got to spit out my gum as soon as I came on live. Remember, <laughs> spit out your gum, Sluter. All right, well, good to see everybody out tonight. Hopefully, <clears throat> we'll have some people tuning in here. Um, a bit of an unannounced video. I posted the post 19 minutes ago that I was going to be going live tonight. Um, kind of a last minute decision here to do this. Um, but I uh, wanted to do a video on Greek itis, a deadly disease. Steve Talley, Victor Ortiz, Andrew Tucker, a few people joining in, tuning in here. Mrs. Hannah, good to see you. Well, God's answers and prayers for us this week, hadn't you, Miss Hannah? But anyway, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm not going to uh, give introductions to everybody, but everybody's tuning in. Everybody that will tune in, welcome. Um, if you are looking for a video um, to say, boy, that is just, that, that's exactly what Brother Sluter believes about that, this is going to be that video. This is going to be the video where if you wonder, if you by some chance don't know where I stand on using Greek, you're going to find out tonight. And if you want to share this on your wall, do whatever, send it to somebody, get them real mad, whatever. I'm this is gonna I'm gonna try to make some clarification statements, clarifying statements, and I'm also gonna try to teach you. If you'll listen, I'm gonna try to teach you something tonight. And you may not agree with it, but I at least want to tell you some a few things uh, about this whole thing about using the Greek. Because let me say this: I have noticed it is it seems like in the past five years, I, I'll, I'll say, there have been more people who've got caught up, and I know it's been a long-running tradition. I know Dr. Ruckman was dealing with it, and and you know all those guys in the past. It's it's always been a thing, but it just seems like within the past five years, ten years, fifteen years, whatever, it seems like there is more and more people who have gotten caught up in this Greek game, thinking that not only is the Greek an okay thing to use, but the Greek is necessary if you want to understand the Bible. And let me say a few things about Greek itis. A lot of preachers, and maybe even some of you watching this, you're getting a bad case of Greek itis. You're Greek and everything up. You think that just because you use a little bit of Greek in your sermon, it makes you seem more intelligent. You think that you somehow have an edge on the truth because you have a Greek concordance. Uh, listen, and you don't even have a you don't even have a Greek lexicon. Some of you guys need to understand that you don't have a Greek. Your Strong's concordance is not a Greek lexicon. Okay, some of you are so ignorant you don't even know the difference between a lexicon and a concordance. Your Greek concordance that you have. In the back of a strong, in the back of your strong concordance, that's not a lexicon. And what you have to understand is that's not scripture. That those Greek definitions in the back of, of the strong concordance, that's not scripture. In fact, the strong concordance, I just heard this this week, the strong concordance says that behemoth is a hippopotamus. If you look in a strong concordance in the back and you look up the Hebrew word for behemoth, it says a hippopotamus. Well, anybody with one eye and half a brain can read that the behemoth in the book of Job had a tail like a cedar tree. You ever see a hippo? Doesn't have a tail like a cedar tree. So your strong concordance is not a Greek lexicon. But let me just say a few things about this deadly disease of Greek itis that's slipping in through our churches, our IFB churches. And people say they're King and I've never understood this. People say they're King James only, and yet they'll pull out their Greek and their Greek lexicon and say, Now, now I believe the King James Bible, but if you look back to the Greek here, this word can also mean, and what they do is they're not correcting the King James Bible per se. They're not saying this word should be this. You Listen, you can correct the Bible just by changing the... De you don't have to change the words to correct the Bible. All you've got to do is change the definition of words. And that's correct in the Bible. And I'm seeing more and more and more of this in our independent Baptist circles that claim to be King James only. Let me just make a few statements about the, the Greek, okay? Number one, number one, you don't speak Greek. You do not even speak Greek. Now, if there's somebody on here that by chance, and I've been looking at all the names, I don't think there's anybody that's been watching thus far that speaks Greek let alone can read it and write it, okay? So let's just clear the air, all you puffed up religious gas bags 
who are getting up behind the pulpits on Sunday mornings trying to impress your people with Greek. You don't even speak the language. You wouldn't even know what the word says if it wasn't for that little dictionary in the back of your Strong's Concordance. Who are you fooling, man? You may be fooling your church and you may be fooling your seminary. You may be fooling some. You ain't fooling me, though. Just today, there was an incident where somebody tried to say that the the Greek language in John 21 was such a blessing to him to see the different usage of the words love, you know, the agape and phileo and all that kind of stuff. And I asked him, could you please, and I, was, I wasn't ugly at all, I was very genuine, very sincere, could you please explain to me how those Greek words are a blessing to you? And of course he couldn't do it. He said, what are you trying to embarrass me just because you know I don't speak Greek? No, I'm asking, you made the statement that the Greek has been a blessing in this one's place. I'm asking you to explain to me, get the Greek words, explain to me what you mean. How's it been a blessing? Maybe I can get a blessing from it. But see, he never did answer the question. He never did tell me because he couldn't tell me because the dude don't speak no Greek. Now, that's proper English right there, isn't it? But that's plain English, easy to be understood. Folks, these guys that want to get up behind their pulpits and talk about the Greek, they don't speak Greek. I doubt they've even taken a college course on Greek. It's always, a, it's always humored me so much to see these guys that can barely read the King's English crop out with a Greek word right in the middle of their sermon. You don't speak Greek. Number two, number two. Not only do you not speak Greek, but you also don't have the originals, okay? Anybody who says that they have the originals is either completely ignorant or completely dishonest. Let me make that statement one more time. Anybody who says that they have the originals or they've seen a copy of the, or excuse me, they've seen the originals or, you know, whatever, they are either completely ignorant or completely a liar. Because nobody on planet Earth today, including your Bible college professors, have the originals. Nobody living today has ever seen the originals. They do not exist. You are probably breathing them in right now. They are molecules of dust flying around the atmosphere. The originals do not exist. They were lost over 18 centuries ago. What we have are copies of 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 copies. So, when people say, well, I, I, I'll stick with the original Greek or the original languages. Okay, number one, you don't have the originals. Nobody knows what the original says. Well, the original said, nobody knows what the original said. Number two, you couldn't even read the originals if you had the originals. Who are you kidding, man? Who are you trying to fool? Now, listen. You say, well, I, I, believe, I believe in the Texas Receptus. I, I, I'm, the, I'm the Texas Receptus. Uh, I, I believe in the, the Texas Receptus, and, and I think that's, you know, I think that is the accurate Greek that we ought to use, and, and, you know, I believe the King James Bible because it's based off the Texas Receptus. Well, let me say this. I do believe that the Texas Receptus is the proper line of manuscript, but all you TR guys who want to talk about your little Texas Receptus, and you say, well, you know, the Greek, act, the Texas Receptus actually says this, and the Texas Receptus actually says that. Let me ask you a question. Why is it that there were 15 editions of the Texas Receptus at the time of the translation of the King James Bible? How do you explain 1 John 2, 23, where the second half of the entire verse is in italics? The second half of 1 John 2, 23 is not found in any edition of the Texas Receptus prior to 1611. Why is it that None of the English Bibles, except for the Coverdale Bible, contains the second half. None of them contain the second half of 1 John 2.23. It's because the King James translators put in 1 John 2.23 not based upon the Texas Receptus. So are you now saying the King James Bible is wrong because of that? See, so you take a Texas Receptus, only, Texas Receptus only position and you cut, it, it's inconsistent. If you had a Texas Receptus in front of you, you couldn't even read it anyway. So you either trust in what some smart, puffed-up professor says in a classroom who doesn't even believe you've got a copy of God's Word, or you can believe the English text that God gave to the English-speaking people. The TR position is completely inconsistent. 
Listen, let me ask you a question, Mr. T.R. Is the King James Bible and the Texas Receptus on the same level? Is the King James Bible just as good and just as perfect as the Texas Receptus? If yes, then why in the world do you even need the Greek? If they're the exact same thing, if they're saying the exact same thing, then why do you even need the Greek? Well, because the Greek language just opens up. Okay, so you're saying the, the King James Bible is insufficient. You can't have your cake and eat it too, man. You're either King James only, or you do not believe the King James Bible is sufficient. You think you got to go to the Greek. And every time you go to the Greek, that's exactly what you're saying, whether you want it to come out of your mouth or not. We have, to, we have to ask the question, what is the final authority? What is your final authority? We have to ask the question, at what point do we say that the Greek is necessary? If you're using the Greek, you think it's necessary for something. And my question is, for what is it, nece what, what is it necessary for? If you're using the Greek in your messages, then you think it's necessary for something. What in the world is it if you're claiming to be King James only and saying the King James Bible is perfect? I'm asking a question, what is it? Let me tell you the real reason guys use the Greek. There's, there's a couple of reasons why guys use the Greek. Number one, number one, they use the Greek because they want to correct something in the King James Bible, even if they say, well, I'm not correcting the King James Bible. That's exactly what they do. This whole husband of one wife thing, I'm not going to get on the divorce issue, but this came up just today. The whole husband of one wife. Now, everybody knows where I stand on that. I don't think that divorce and remarriage automatically disqualifies a man from the pastorate or, the, or being a deacon. And so some of these guys were on Twitter today saying, well, that Greek word one means first. It's the same word translated first. Well, wait a second. Should it be first in 1 Timothy 3, 2, or should it be one? But they, we had King James only guys who were spewing out that garbage. Well, that's the same. That Greek word means first as well. Wait a second. Should, were the King James translators wrong in translating it one? But not only that, here's the thing, folks. All those, all those, you know, once married, we only believe in once married preachers. They don't even believe. If that, if that truly means first, and that you can say, well, that's just the same as saying first, the husband of his first wife. Well, then if a man's wife dies and he gets remarried, that's not his first wife, that's his second one. See, they don't even believe in one and done. They believe it one at a time with the exception being death and ignore the other ones. But they, they have to pull out the Greek to try to grasp onto something to make their dumb little theology work. How about this one? The Greek game when it comes to the agape phileo thing. Agape phileo, agape phileo. Oh, John 21, just when we talk about, you know, the, when you really read it in the Greek and you really see the, the deep blessing and meaning of what Jesus is really trying to, to put forth and blah, 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 blah. Let me just show you something. I got a strong concordance right here on my phone, right here on my phone. Or excuse me, my iPad. I'm, I'm on the phone here. Let me show you this. All right. I don't, let me see. Yeah, you guys can see this. Hold on. It's going to be backwards to you, but just bear with me here for a moment. Now, I want you to look here. Look here. Verse 16. Verse 16. You ready for this? Watch this. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Look at lovest thou. You click on that right there, and it pulls up the word. Look there. Right here. See it? Agape. All right? It's actually... Uh, agapeo, or however you say it, but you can see it there. It's, it's the word agape there. All right? Now, notice this. Very close. This is the Strong's Concordance. It says, perhaps from whatever that Greek word is, agon, much or compare, compare H5, uh, 5689 to love in a social or moral sense. Love compare with G5, uh, 5368. Now, stay with me here. Stay with me here. Watch this. Let's continue reading the verse. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Look, different word here. I love thee. This is the one we just read about. G5368. Let's click on it. Look at what it says here. Amazing, folks. 
to be a friend to, fond of, an individual or an object. That is, to have an affection for, denoting personal attachment as a matter of sentiment or feeling. While G25, the agape, is wider, uh, wider embracing, especially the judgment and the deliberate assent of the will, as a matter of principle, duty, and propriety. The two thus stand related very much. They stand related very much. Now notice here. So the Jesus says, do you agape love me? You ready for this? Peter answers with the phileo, which most people say is like, oh, that's that brotherly love. Okay, well, let's read on. He says, then feed my lambs, verse 16. He saith unto him the third, uh, excuse me, verse 16. Look, he, Jesus asked in verse 15, lovest thou me, agape. Peter answers with, right here, the phileo. He says again, Peter, lovest thou me, agape, verse 25. Peter answers with phileo. Stay with me now. Verse 17, Jesus says, lovest thou me? But notice, look what it says in verse 17, lovest. He uses the phileo. And Peter answers with phileo. Or excuse me, hang on, done. And Peter answers with this one. Phileo, right here. And he, Jesus gives him the same answer every time. Feed my lambs, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Let me ask you a question. Jesus asked Peter twice, agape me, agape me. And Peter answers with, I phileo you, I phileo you. And then, he find, and then Jesus the third time says, phileo me. And, and Peter says, thou knowest all things, you know that I phileo you. What's the deep significance here? What am I missing? What's, what, what's, what's the deep blessing you get out of that? If anything, Jesus settles for the fact that Peter's never going to have a deep godly love for him. Do you, <laughs> Guys, this is a rocket science. If anything, Jesus says, do you agape me? Do you godly, unconditionally love me, Peter? And Peter answers both times, well, I phileo love you. And then finally Jesus says, Peter, do you phileo love me? Oh, yeah, Lord, you know all things. You know I phileo love you. What's the blessing in that? That's like saying that Jesus is settling for a, for a brotherly love instead of an unconditional love. And if you look up the word love in the King James Bible and look at all the different times, listen, you've got the Pharisees having this agape love for themselves. You've got, you've got Jesus. You've got certain times where God is showing phileo love. It does, it's inconsistent. It doesn't even make sense. It's dumb. It's stupid. And listen, all it is, let me, let me, let me, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to start to close out here. All this does is try to get these preachers who won't study their Bible, who won't dig into the English text that God gave them, they will not by any means actually pick up a Dr. Ruckman book or a Bill Grady book or a Sam Gitt book. The, oh, those, oh, those Ruckmanites, those Ruckmanites. And they stayed stupid for the past 45, 50 years refusing to get truth from somebody that they thought was inferior to them. And now they've got to run to the Greek to try to make themselves somehow sound more spiritual and more, uh, more studious to their people because they can't give them what the Bible actually says. And that's the truth. All these religious gas bags are doing is masquerading behind their own college degrees from Bible colleges that only taught them how to balance a budget, counsel people, and run a bus route. And they hide behind those college degrees using their little Greek concordances, trying to make their people somehow think that they're intelligent and know the Bible, when all they've done is just taken the same five messages that they've got, put new titles on them, and use different Greek words to try to make people think they study. I wouldn't give you, I wouldn't give you a dime for two nickels for a preacher who gets up and uses the Greek to try to make everything, everybody think he sounds smart, but then couldn't even tell you the difference between the day of the Lord and the day of Christ. I wouldn't give you a dime for two. I wouldn't give you a dime for two nickels for these preachers that get up and try to phileo and agape everything, but they couldn't even tell you about the seven baptisms. I wouldn't give you a dime for two nickels. These preachers that they they don't even know what spiritual circumcision is. They've never even read the English Bible all the way through, and yet they want to get up there and try to tell you what the Greek says. 
man, why don't you get your face in the book and actually study what the English Bible says? I Listen, I have more respect for a man that gets up, gets up and preaches Jesus Christ and him crucified and admits when he doesn't know something and says, I don't know, but but I'll study it out. Or if so, I, Listen, I have more respect for a man like that than these guys who want to get up and try to masquerade themselves as Bible scholars. They even call themselves Bible. He's a Bible scholar. They know such thing as a Bible scholar. Look up the word scholar and then tell me if you think there are any Bible scholars. Now, this greek Greekitis is a deadly game. It's a deadly game. Here's what it all boils down to. You either think you've got the perfect, inerrant, infallible word of God in English, or you don't. If you think you have the absolute final authority for the English-speaking people in the King James Bible, then why in the world are you going back to the Greek? Why? Tell me why. What can the Greek do for the English? What can we find out further from the Greek that we couldn't find out in the English? And if you say anything, if you say that there's one thing we can find in the Greek that we can't find in the English, then you, my friend, are not King James only, and you need to quit lying to people and telling them that you are. Greek itis, it's a deadly disease. It spreads, it infects, and everybody, everybody that uses the Greek and overshadows the English with the Greek eventually begins to take a weak stance on the King James Bible. You watch, hide and watch, hide and watch. Folks, there's two things that I get belligerent about. I'm talking about belligerent. When you start messing with salvation, and when you start messing with the book. I like what Ruckman says. You pick on that book, I'll pick on you. You start messing with that Bible and start using the Greek to twist around what the English says and you start trying to make Scripture say what they don't. Listen, you mess with that book, I'll mess with you. And I'm about sick and tired of our young men, our young preachers getting this idea that they can't trust their English Bible. My King James Bible is not the closest thing we have to the Word of God. My King James Bible is the Word of God. There are no unfortunate translations. There are no outdated... Listen, there are no words. And every word in there is there by divine inspiration. And you say, well, there, there's archaic words in there. There's not a single archaic word in this Bible that you can't do a quick Google search on and find out what the meaning of it is. You're lazy is your problem. I don't have the closest thing to the Word of God. I have the Word of God. This isn't the best thing. This is the only thing. And if you don't like it, then lump it. And all you preachers out there that are going to keep on casting doubt on God's Word, keep on casting doubt on the King James Bible, using all that Greek, you're going to stand before God, and He's going to look down and ask you, why is there an entire generation of young preachers that... You, they had my book in their very hands. There's, listen, folks, there's some of you, you would never touch anything but a King James Bible, but yet while all the while you have the King James Bible in your hand, you've got a Greek concordance over there trying to figure out what the King James Bible really says using the Greek. Just use the King James Bible. And there, a whole lot of people are going to be placed in your lap at the judgment seat of Christ, and God's going to ask you, why in the world did you destroy their faith in this book? Bible colleges, in an attempt to sound educational and smart and have all these degrees. Listen, I don't care. I don't care if you've got more degrees than a thermometer or if you've got more letters behind your name than the alphabet. I don't care. There is no amount of educational, uh, 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 no amount of educational grandeur, whatever you want to call it, that can impress me. When you've got Crown College having in Ken Ham, Crown College for their past for their past um, graduation ceremony had in Bob Jones the Third, 
Can anybody tell me when Bob Jones III started being a King James only guy? Can anybody tell me that? When did Bob Jones III all of a sudden become King James only and start believing the Bible? But Clarence Sexton's going to have him in for his graduation ceremony? What's that about? You like it or lump it, folks. Doesn't bother me a lick. It's hypocrisy. And it is absolutely disgusting the way that supposed King James Bible believers are acting towards the King James Bible. A man who uses other translations isn't a lover of God's word. A man who uses other translations is not a faithful student of the scriptures. A man who uses other translations, they don't even have the scriptures. They don't even have God's words. They have filthy perversions of God's words. Need I remind the IFB movement that those modern perverse translations are not the word of God? Need I remind you that those who are using those translations are using corruptions of God's very words? Need I remind you of this? Why should I be reminding? I thought our movement had this settled years ago. Evidently not. You better understand and understand very well that there's a group of young men and young preachers coming up I myself being one of them, we're not compromising this book. If I'm the last preacher to, st if I'm the last preacher on planet Earth that refuses to bow down to the educational hierarchy of Bible colleges and seminaries that are pumping out Bible denying philosophers instead of Bible called preachers, if I'm the last one on planet Earth standing, I'll stand alone on the Word of God, the B I B L E. I'll stand when nobody else is. But there, I'm, I'm encouraged that there's a group of young preachers coming up. They refuse to be intimidated by the educational system set in place. It's nothing more than a Laodicean, Nicolaitan hierarchy of bullies who think that they have some kind of one-up or, or, or monopoly on God's word because they can look at a Greek concordance just like anybody else. I refuse to bow down to these bullies. And you hear me and hear me well. The first time Satan ever shows up in the word of God he's sitting under the Martin Luther said he was sitting under the tree of knowledge and he's never left since knowledge puffeth up first time Satan ever is found in the scriptures he's sitting under the tree of knowledge and he's never left folks you've been warned you've got a king you've got a bible you can trust right there in your hands you've got a bible you can trust I love you I'm praying for you. Hey, like and share this video. Get the, if you're King James only and you're sick of all these Greekers infecting our young people, get the video out there. Listen, I love you and I'm praying. You say, preacher, you're getting awful. You're getting awful, awful uh, in your face about this. Yeah, because we're talking about the book, man. We're talking about the book. So listen, folks, I love you. Regardless of where you stand, I love you. But uh, if you mess with that book, don't you dare expect me just to sit back and watch you do it. I'm going to say something. All right, folks, I love you. I'm praying for you. Hope you have wonderful days out soul winning. If you don't go soul winning, why don't you try it? You'll have a good time, I promise you. Lord bless you. Have a wonderful night.